and welcome again GCSE geographers to another dog pod. This is part two of changing climate and we're going to get started straight away by looking at the global impacts of climate change. Now there is lots of global impacts of climate change and they are not even all covered on this slide for you. However, what you need is a broad understanding of a couple of types of impacts. Now on here for you are extreme weather, rising sea levels, food supply problems, and animal issues, disease and health problems, water supply and climate refugees. I'm going to pick two or three just to go through really briefly with you. So remember that these impacts are all about social, economic and environmental problems that exist because of climate change. So extreme weather is an easy one. All right. So we know that because of temperature rises, that the climate is becoming more unpredictable. And we know that temperature rises cause warmer seas, and that, that means there are more frequent and sometimes even more powerful tropical storms, for example. So Typhoon Haiyan, which is one of your case studies in Global Hazards of 2013, that was a super typhoon, and one of the reasons can be linked to climate change and increasing temperatures. We also have other problems such as food supply issues. We know that with warmer temperatures in some regions of the world and changing rainfall patterns, um, it's going to make it harder to grow the crops we want to in certain places around the world. And that means that our reliability of food could be challenged going forward in the next 50 years if we continue to see some areas having masses of change in temperature and rainfall. And then the final one I want to go through with you is disease and health. So we know that also temperature rise can spree increased spread of infectious diseases, such as malaria, which is a well-known disease that obviously had an, a massive outbreak about seven or eight years ago and still exists. Um, so if any of you ever go on holiday to certain tropical regions, you may find you need malaria tablets. Um, so essentially what can happen is as warmer temperatures exist, it allows those airborne particularly diseases and also the waterborne diseases to spread more easily. So they are three examples out of all of seven or eight there for you on the global impacts of climate change. Now I'm going to hand over to Sora to look at a specific place, a global example of rising sea levels. So Perfect. Thank you, sir. So, yeah, really, really just nice and clear. As Mr. Hatchell just said, you're going to need to lose no, two cases of this bit, one that's global and related to uh, rising sea levels. And then you're going to look at the UK later, which Mr. Hatchell will go through. So if we think about Tuvalu, well, it's in the South Pacific, so it's a very remote, tiny island. Uh, some key things to bear in mind is that it's only 4.5 metres above sea level. So it's obviously very much at risk of that sea level rise. And there's a population of about 11,000. So that's definitely something, if you're making your case study cards, is something to write down. It gives you some context. You know, what happens to these 11,000 people? You know, there's a section on the previous slide which talks about climate refugees. Well, all of those people could potentially become climate refugees in the future. So again, with all case studies, we want to generally think about impact and social, economic, environmental as we go through that. So again, I won't read it all word for word, but some key social ones you might think about is obviously as that sea level rise uh, occurs, those higher tides at higher sea level is also going to threaten homes and roads. People are going to have to move. If they are moved uh, through force or not through their own choice, we might call that displacement or displace people. And if it continues to the extent that the whole island has to be uh, removed or moved to a different area, then obviously they become climate refugees. Again, as wells become uh, polluted, so that rising sea level means that the wells that they've dug can mix with, you know, sanitation and those sort of pipes. Again, that can spread and lead to further disease. In terms of economics, you might remember in your lessons, there was actually one main runway. So if they lose that runway, well, that's going to impact, again, their ability to trade. And they rely on exporting certain resources or bringing in food supply because they are an LIDC. Some key things, again, you can see about that coastal land being destroyed, so farmland. But the one above, I just want to pick up as well, because it mentions salinization. And I know a few of my, my kids will go, oh, what does that mean? Well, effectively, we're thinking about salt. That's really the, the basic term. And the idea that obviously as the sea level rise, more salt gets onto the land. And even way back in history, um, Romans would sow salt on, you know, their conquered people's land to punish them, you know. So it has a negative impact. So, again, it impacts on the yield of crops. That's a nice term. So yield is about the amount that they can grow. 
okay, in a year sort of supply, so to speak. And again, in terms of environmental, obviously that warmer temperatures will damage things like uh, ecosystems like coral reefs. So again, if you've seen that, you know, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, they go, they go through something that's called like bleach, uh, leaching, okay, um, through bleaching. And what that does, it basically gets rid of all the colour of those coral and they basically die. OK, so there's loads of good stuff, again, if you want to in research that in your own time. But one other thing we just want to be conscious about for these is, well, what are they doing about this then? Well, one, obviously, they're trying to raise awareness internationally for that reduction by raising awareness of their plight. Other places like the Maldives also do a similar. In fact, the Maldives even held a government um, meeting underneath water in scuba gear to try and show that, you know, eventually their, their land's going to be underwater. So Tulu didn't quite do that, but they are, again, campaigning internationally. They're looking at potentially, you know, moving po their population or parts of the population to other places, in particular New Zealand, which is obviously one of the nearest places. Again, they can use hard or soft engineering in terms of seawalls and to help prevent erosion and flooding, whilst also, again, working with sort of Japan to restore that reef um, of the coral reef that's been damaged to try and address those environmental factors. Again, all that management addresses those social, economic, environmental things that we've talked about. So that's Tuvalu in very much a nutshell. Obviously, it's an LIDC. So what we also want to look at is, well, what other impacts are there in terms of the positives and negatives in another place? Mr. Hatchell, over to you for the UK. Thank you very much, sir. So your other case study, which is your UK case study for impact of climate change is, of course, the UK. Now, this is actually a pretty simple case study, and some of you will have had prior knowledge of this even before you came to Sammy Whitbread or study GCSE geography. So what we need to look at here are the negative impacts of climate change for the UK and the positive ones. Now I'm gonna start with the negative ones. And again, I'm gonna go through three negatives and three positives here, right? There are four for each, but you can choose which you want to do. But you need to have three. So let's start with coastal flooding. Of course, we have a lot of low lying, low land areas around our coastlines. And there are houses along those coastlines, for example, the Holderness Coast and the East Coast, right, near Norwich there. That is a low-lying area on the coastline, and that is soft rock as well, whereby it's eroding quite easily. If sea levels rise because of climate change, we are going to see those vulnerable low-lying areas being damaged even further and those homes and infrastructure areas lost. We're going to see more erosion because of the soft rock existing there. And that all means really damage to the local economy. So those seaside towns may see damage to their tourist industry, may see damage to the homes and properties there and so on. So coastal flooding can become a real issue, particularly for low lying coasts. We also have extreme rainfall. We know that as temperatures rise, the climate becomes more un unstable. And actually, in the last 50 years in the UK, we have seen more uh, flash flooding and flooding in general. And this is particularly linked to climate change. So what that does is it floods and it damages homes and businesses. And it also contaminates soil, which is used for farmland. And that links to Tuvalu in a way as a global impact of sea level rise. When the soil of farmland is contaminated, it damages the crops and the soil loses its ability to grow further crops as efficiently as it did before. I'm also going to then look at extreme heat as the third one. We know as temperatures rise that our temperatures generally are rising in summer, particularly in the last few years, we've had some really hot summers unusual for the UK and temperature records have been broken a couple of times and um, warmer weather can lead to health problems, particularly in young babies and elderly people. And because young babies and elderly people have weaker immune systems, they struggle with the extreme heat and their body can't fight the extreme heat as well. But it also leads to infectious diseases spreading, as we said earlier, like malaria. And actually, it is not out of the realm of possibility that in the next few hundred years, if the UK's temperature continues to rise, that we will not get more infectious diseases like malaria. So we may have to contend with that in a couple of hundred years time as we become more of a tropical area and as warmth continues to spread to the UK. So there are three negative impacts of climate change in the UK. However, not all of climate change for the UK is negative. And we have also got some really positive impacts of climate change for the UK. And the biggest one is tourism. 
the warmer the UK is, the better the weather in summer the UK has, the more likely people are to visit the UK for holidays and also that we are likely to take our holidays in the UK at coastlines, for example. That. And we could also have more outdoor events, like festivals in the summer and so on, which also therefore create more money, more jobs and so forth. So tourism could be a big positive impact of climate change going forward. Farming also. Now, I always use the example of grapes in the southeast of England, because currently we can actually grow grapes in the southeast of England where 30 or 40 years ago we couldn't. And that's because generally in spring and summer, our temperatures are higher than they used to be. So agriculture will change, but actually it may increase in productivity because of warmer conditions. So farmers can grow things like grapes that they haven't been able to before. And I'll just give you an example of that as well. We now have English wines, English sparkling wines that we didn't have 40 or 50 years ago because we are able to grow those grapes that we weren't previously able to grow. And finally, another positive impact of climate change for the UK is very simply the environment in terms of the environmental areas we've got, wetlands, for example, along the coastlines, um, due to coastal flooding, we could have these wetlands established. Now, what wetlands are, are essentially part of the landscape where the sea has taken off. Okay? Coastal flooding has happened. But what that creates is new wildlife sanctuaries for plants and for animals. And that could be drawn to the UK, which could actually link to tourism because wetlands are a place visited by tourists quite a lot. And obviously that's good for the natural environment because we have more different species of plants and animals. So that's another type of positive impact for climate change in the UK. Mr. Knight, would you have anything to add to those? No, I think you've done a really good job there, sir. I think it sets the nicer to use up their case study booklets, find out a few facts and figures to support these, these key ideas as well. But no, I think you've run through that, that brilliantly, sir. Thank you, sir. So the last section then, which Mr. Knight is going to talk to you about, is how we're actually tackling this climate change problem around the world and he's going to briefly talk you through the very important Paris Agreement of 2015. Mr Unite. Yeah, no worries. Let's try and do it maybe about 60 seconds. So if you want to use the Paris Agreement, obviously it's there to suggest how on a global scale we're trying to address with climate change. So when we think about global, we want to think about why is it a global example? Well, 195 countries made a legally binding uh, deal together to try to work towards addressing climate change. So that's one good fact, 195 countries. The second and arguably most important fact is that the target or aim of the Paris Agreement is to limit global warming to below two degrees uh, Celsius. So try and stop avoiding that point. And if you know much about climate change, if you've been in the news, you'll see again the expectation of what happens if it's like one degree, 1.5, two degrees, 2.5. So two degrees is one that we've sort of determined as one that's being manageable, that we can work with and doesn't cause too many impacts. So essentially, the so reasons why they went for that is that limits emissions to what were uh, our level or climate level um, before the pre-industrial period. That that's a idea or a sustainable level for us to be at. Again, within that, it allows countries to sort of share, communicate plans with the public, to share ideas, to come up with new technology and encourages that global debate and recognition. For a country like Tuvalu, well, how are they really going to get, you know, that international recognition? So things like this is really important because obviously it allows people like Tuvalu to have a seat at the table to discuss and have that bigger picture. Otherwise, what can really a tiny island in the South Pacific do? So again, it's all about trying to provide support to those developing countries at reducing emissions, trying to give them access to that technology, the skills and knowledge, that sort of thing. One thing to bear in mind as well is obviously some of you always mention that in about, I think it was about 2017, it was the start of when he became president, but uh, Donald Trump took the USA out of this particular agreement. But just as a side way, I think Mr. Mr. Biden might well be bringing them back in at some point if he hasn't already started that paper. I think he might have done, to be fair. Maybe you're a bit more up to, cut, up to date with the current affairs there, sir. But uh, I thought he was talking yeah. about bringing it back in, wasn't it? I think they were doing the paperwork to, to make that return. Yeah, so he signed the uh, Paris Agreement again about three to four weeks ago. So uh, yeah, she's done. I've never seen four weeks. Yeah, it takes just over four weeks for them to opt back in. So they only actually left for a few days, really, because it took Mr. Trump so long to get out of the agreement. And basically, the USA is back in in the next few days already. So he's back in in March 2021. Oh, superb. Good knowledge there, sir.
Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. So that is all of Climate Change Part 2, particularly the case studies complete now. So make sure you've watched Part 1 as well of this video that looked at some of the basics around climate change. That is all we have for you today. I uh, hope you found this useful and thank you, Mr. Unite, for joining me. And no we'll, see you, we'll see you in another job call. Take care.